Good evening, everyone, and happy midweek to all of you. Welcome to our midweek prayer service this evening. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to make an announcement. This coming uh, October, October 9, from October 9 to 23rd, uh, there will be virtual evangelism. So October 9 to 23, from 7.30 to 8.45, there will be an online evangelism. Please uh, ask your leaders on this one. And the speaker is none other than uh, Pastor Abel Cordero uh, from Moreno Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church, California. So if you have seen this kind of invitation, this is the um, online or virtual evangelism this coming October 9 to 23. It means that there will be no um, midweek service, but instead we will go to virtual service uh, for our evangelism October 9 to 23rd. So tonight, our book for study is about the uh, book of Song of Solomon. So we are now on the book of Song of Solomon. So uh, please open your Bible with me to the book of Song of Solomon. And this is the focus of our study this evening. And before that, let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our dear God, Heavenly Father, this evening, O oh Lord, we once again approach your throne of grace because we believe that uh, you will give us wisdom and understanding to appreciate the message of this book for this evening. Be with our brothers and sisters who are listening uh, tonight. May they receive peace and blessings from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we have the Song of Solomon and according to some authors, this book deals with marriage. Right? Marriage. And not only marriage, but it also picture or Tell something about the love of God for his people, the love of God for his church, or the love of God for human beings. So once again, uh, the purpose of this book is uh, to tell of the love between a bridegroom, which is in this book King Solomon, and his bride, and to affirm the sanctity of marriage and also to picture God's love for his people. So uh, these are uh, the purpose of this book. But I would like to go to the message of this book uh, to the love of God for his people. And now I'd like to share with you that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God or Jesus Christ is the husband. I'd like you to uh, open your Bible with me to the book of John. Turn your Bible with me to the book of John and we will uh, read verses from both the Old and New Testament in order for us to understand the message this evening. I'd like to read from the book of John chapter 1 and the verse is 18. John chapter 1 verse 18. I'll be reading from a modern English version. No one has seen God at any time. The only son who is at the father's side has made him known. According to the word of Jesus Christ or according to the book of John chapter 1, 
Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. There is also another passage which is also in the book of John chapter 6 and the verse is 46. This is based on the statement of Jesus Christ. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. And then there's another one in 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, 4, 1 John 4, and the verse, I think it's 12, okay? 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, the main point of this reading is this. No one has seen God or no one has seen the Father. And if that is the case, then who is the God in the Old Testament who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who is the God in the Old Testament who appeared to them? And in fact, if you're going to read the book of the five books of Moses, you would see there that God talked talk, talk to Moses face to face as a friend. Okay, in the book of Genesis chapter 17 and chapter 18, you would see that God appeared to Abraham. Now, who is this God? If no one has seen the Father, that is the question. And we will take a look later what is the connection of the love of God to his church. Now let's take a look and find the answer from uh, another reading. Uh, let's say in the book of Isaiah. Let's take a look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. Isaiah 54, and the verse is 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He shall be called the God of the whole earth. Now you would see here that the maker, okay, is called the husband. The Lord of hosts. But he is also the Redeemer. And he is the God of, of all the earth. So he is the Maker. He is the Redeemer. He is also the Husband. Right? Uh, this is very clear. Another passage is in the book of Jeremiah. Let's take a look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, then verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. Return, O backsliding sons, says the Lord, for I am married to you. And then when you look at verse 19, But I said, How can I put you among my sons? and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful heritage of the nations. And I said, you shall call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. And then verse 22, return, O backsliding sons, and I will heal your backslidings. Now, the same idea, the Lord is called the husband because he is married to his people, according to verse 14. But this husband is also called, verse 19, my father. Right? So the husband and the father is one and, one and the same. I want you to understand that. And you will see the beauty of the gospel here later on and the love of God for us. 
Now, there's another passage in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and the verse is 9. 31, verse 9. And it says there, let me see. They will come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now again, the God of Israel, he said, I am a father to Israel. That is Jeremiah 31 verse 9. Now let's take a look at 32. In verse 32, it says, It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their, with their fathers. In the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Now you will see here, in verse 9, he is called the father. And then in verse 32, he is the husband. And he, this is the same Lord. The husband and the father. In other book, the redeemer, the savior, the rock. And also, uh, let's take a look why this God who appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, and to Moses and to the other prophets in the Old Testament is not the father that Christ mentioned in the Old Testament. Because according to him, no one has seen the father. This God, okay, became father because according to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, look at verse 3. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are just. He is a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Now look at verse 18. But first, I want you to notice this, that this God, according to verse 3 and 4, he is the rock. But according to verse 18, you have forgotten the rock who begot you. You are unmindful and have forgotten the God who gave you birth. And that is why this God assumed, okay, or let's say uh, revealed himself to his people as their father. Because he is the one, according to him, that gave birth to his people. And if you want to understand the birthing of his people, then turn your Bible to the book of Isaiah and you will understand why this God is called the Father, the Redeemer, the Rock, okay? The Husband. This is not the Father, that Jesus Christ refers to because according to him, we read from the New Testament, no one has seen the Father at any time. Okay? Now, let's go to the book of Isaiah. And you will see there that in the book of Isaiah, let's take a look, Isaiah 54 and the verses 5, we read, we read that, I think, earlier. But let us read again, 54 verse 5 of Isaiah. For your maker is your husband. Can you imagine? Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He shall be called the God of all the earth. Now in here, when you read, okay? I know you love to read. So you can read chapter 40 of Isaiah, up to, let's say, chapter 46, right? 
chapter 40, chapter 46. But I will pick up some, some verses here. All right. Chapter, let's say, chapter 43. Chapter 43 of Isaiah. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. So he is what? The creator of Jacob or Israel. And he is the one who formed his people. Now, it says in verse 6, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Okay? He called these people my son. Okay? And then uh, he said in verse 21, These people I have formed for myself. Chapter 44, verse 2, Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. Okay, so there's a lot of things here in the book of Isaiah, again, 44 verse 8, the last part of that verse, is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know, not any. Okay, we read from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, he's also the rock there. And then also in, uh, let's say, 24, chapter 44, verse 24. That says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he formed you from the womb. So that's why he is called Father. He is called Father. Another thing here in the book of Exodus. Look at the book of Exodus and you will see there. But I will preach again on this one, okay, later. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. You shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So, I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. So this God, who is called the Father, because he is the one who created Jacob, or Israel, or his people. And he is the one that begot, begotten them. And as Father, he called his people as my Firstborn. So you now, you now know why he is called the father. Okay? But this father is also the husband of God's people. We read that from Jeremiah, from Isaiah, and there's also in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, 19 and 20, or 18 to 20. Okay? He is betrothed to his people or married to his people. It's the same God. Okay? But this God is the God who appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Do you want to read some verses on that one? So let's open our Bible. First, first, let's take a look at the book of Genesis and you will see here the statement of God. Chapter 3, verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for both Adam and his wife and clothed them. The Lord God said, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. The man has become like one of us. 
And who is that God that like us? He is also called the Son of Man, which is none other than, in the New Testament name, Jesus the Savior, the Messiah, the Anointed. Okay? Now, chapter 17 when, of Genesis, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. You can read chapter 17 and you will see there that God the Almighty that appeared to him spoke with him. And then after some conversation according to verse 22, then he stopped talking with Abraham, that is God, and God went up from him. Now, another thing, chapter 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham. And again, God talked to Abraham. And he was talking to Abraham. And after so much talking, uh, again, verse 33, the Lord went his way as soon as he had stopped speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So this God who appeared to Abraham is not the God that Jesus Christ mentioned in John 18, John 6, 46, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen the Father. So who is this God that call himself the husband and the father? This is none other than we call in theology the second person of the Godhead. Now, when you look at your Bible, you will see again and again, let's like say for example, Genesis 26 verse 24 the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Again, the Lord appeared to Isaac. And now, after that, you would also notice in chapter 28, the Lord again, this God, appeared to Jacob in verse 13, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Okay? The Lord appeared to Jacob. So, again, when you look at chapter 31 of Genesis, verse 10 or 11, the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here I am. He said, Now lift up your eyes and see all the male goats which meet with the flock are stripped, speckled and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has done to you. I am the God okay, of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, where you vowed a vow to me. Now, Look at this. The angel of God is, in verse 13, is the God of Bethel. Now, you would say, why the angel of God? Angel means messenger. And in the context, God has a message for Jacob. And that is why sometimes he is called the angel of God. But he is none other than God in verse 13. 13. Now look at verse 30, chapter 32. Once again, verse 30. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and my life has been preserved. But if you're going to read, okay, if you're going to read from verse 24, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him there until daybreak. Why this God sometimes is called a man? 
because he decided to appear with Jacob because this God wanted uh, to give blessing to Jacob before he meets his brother Esau. You understand me? In here. And there is no problem but when sometimes the Bible called a man because in the second person of the Godhead there is only one son of man. That's why we read from the book of Genesis chapter 3 Behold, the man has become like one of us. And who is that? Man. And he became like one of us, of his people. Now, now I want to establish here. There's so many things. But when you go to the book of Genesis 35, chapter 35, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, dwell there, and make an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So this is very clear that the God who appeared to him in Bethel is none other than God. Now in verse 11, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Okay? Then after again this conversation, verse 13, God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Who is this God who appeared to these patriarchs. Not the father that Jesus Christ mentioned because he said, John 1 18, John 6 46, 1 John 4 12, no one has seen the father. So who is this God who appeared to them? This is not the father that Jesus Christ mentioned because this God appeared, talked, and conversed with them. And in the Old Testament, this God, okay, is the one who created his people. That's why he is called the Father. Because he called his people his sons. And when they made a covenant, again, he's also their husband. And they were married because of that covenant. Covenant relationship. That's why marriage is also called a covenant relationship between two individuals. Now, let's go to Exodus. And you will see here again in the book of Exodus. Is this the same God in the book of Genesis? Okay. So let's take a look at Exodus. Chapter 3, verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So the God who appeared to Moses, okay, is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then this God said in verse 14, he said to Moses, I am who I am. Who are you, Lord? I am. If you want to know that I am, I am. That I am. Because he is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. And then he said, you will say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now verse 15, God moreover said to Moses, thus you will say to the children of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And when Jesus Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. We read when we discuss about the book of uh, Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you read the book of John, Jesus Christ said, I am the good shepherd. Can you imagine this? 
Okay? Now, so much for that. What happened to this God? First Timothy, I read this before, but I will read it again for the sake of clarity. I'll be reading from Modern English Version. This is the new version of the King James Version, okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 Without question, great is the mystery of godliness. God was revealed in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. So the God of the Old Testament was now revealed in the flesh. And that's why John said in John chapter 1, the Word, who is God, in verse 1, the Word was God, but in verse 14 of John 1, 14, this God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he said in verse 18, no one has seen the Father so, the God of the Old Testament was now manifested or revealed in the flesh because of His love for His people and for the church in the New Testament. He is the husband in the Old Testament because of covenant relationship with His people, but He is also called the Father. I read it to you, some verses. And this father, who is called father, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And I will read some more on this one for you to understand. Chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Why? This God is called Eternal Father. Because he is the same God who is married to his people. He is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now according to prophecy, this eternal father will be born. <clears throat> and who is that? Jesus Christ. He is the rock. The foundation, sto the foundation stone of the church. He is the rock. He is the God in the Old Testament. Because according to him, no one has ever seen God at any time. Now, <clears throat> when you read the entire book of Isaiah, you will understand the prophecy of Isaiah 9.6 because, look at your Bible, uh, why he is called father? Because his people, he called his people, my sons. Okay? And Isaiah. And then, when you turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 63, beginning from... Chapter 63, 16, you will see there. For you are our father, though Abraham is ignorant of us, and Israel does not recognize us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer. Your name is from everlasting. Now, who is the redeemer in the New Testament? Who is the savior in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. Because he is the God who was manifested or revealed in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Okay? According to 1 Timothy that we just read earlier. Now, according to verse 8 of Isaiah 64, turn your Bible again, Isaiah 64 verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. But according to the big picture or context of Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, this father, according to Isaiah 9.6, will be born. 
So when Jesus Christ appeared in the New Testament, he said again, John 1.18, John 6.46, 1 John 4.12, No one has seen the Father at any time. So the Father in the Old Testament is not the Father that Jesus Christ mentioned in the New Testament. Why he is called Father in the Old Testament? Because he called his people, My Son, My Firstborn Son. He begot them or begotten them. According to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 4 and 18. So this is very clear in the Bible. But some people say uh, that's what modalism is. That the father is the son and the son is the father. No. That is the problem with modalism. And the Holy Spirit is the son and the Holy Spirit is also called the father. No. It is not. Because it is very clear in the Old Testament that even though in the Old Testament the God who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and some other prophets, he is called the Father, the Redeemer, the Savior, and the Husband. Because of covenant relationship, he is the God that was revealed in the flesh. John 1.18 and 1 Timothy, or John 1.14 and 1 Timothy let me read again, 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 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 3 and the verse is, I think, 16. If I'm not mistaken. You can read it part. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If you have NIV and if you have NASB, if you have ESV and uh, some other translations, uh, you would find the word he was revealed in the flesh. And who is that he? And you compare other scriptures like King James, New King James, and Modern English Version, the he there is none other than God was revealed in the flesh. So I hope that this is very clear to us. Now, because the book of Solomon is about the love of God for his people and for his church. Now let's go to the book of the New Testament. And before we proceed to that, why no one has seen the Father? That is the question. There's only one that I know. You can correct me, okay? Or send me a, a text that in the Old Testament that the text uh, talks about the Father. And that is Daniel chapter 7. He is called the Ancient of Days. You see? The Ancient of Days. Why he is or why no one has seen the Father? Because according to the teachings of Paul, I'll give you an example here. In Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, turn your Bible with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. And the verse is 15, because this God is what? Invisible God. Invisible God. But when Jesus Christ said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, he is the express image of his person. Alright? And according to verse 15 of Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. So when the book of Genesis says, God created man in the image of God, who is that image? The Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, because He is the image of the invisible God. 
the God who is invisible, no one has sinned. But the God who appeared and talked to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the second person of the Godhead. He loved us. That's why He manifested in order for us to be saved from this wicked generation, from sins. Now, when you go to the book of Ephesians, you will see there the love of God to us, right? Just like the message of Song of Solomon, the love of King Solomon for his bride, the Shulamite woman. So let's go to the application of that book. Ephesians chapter 5, and you will see here from verse 22, Wives, be submissive to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head and Savior of the church, which is his body. So the head of the church of the body is Christ and he is also the savior of the church which is his body so when you belong to a church we have an assurance of salvation because we have a savior those who are outside of the church God will judge them according to the light that they have received but those who belong to the church, they are saved because God redeemed this by his own blood. Because the church has the Savior. If our church has no Savior, I will not be a member of this church. But because according to the Bible, this church has a Savior, I decided to be part of the church. Praise the Lord for that. Now, let's continue reading. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's why the message of Song of Solomon is about the message, one, of King Solomon to his, uh, let's say, lover or bride, the Shulamite woman. The message is also the love of Jesus Christ, who is the husband, who is the head of the church. And according to the book of Ephesians, he gave himself for it. Now let's turn our Bible to the book of Acts chapter 20 and you will see there how did Christ give himself for the church. Chapter 20 of Acts. Turn our Bible to the book of Acts chapter 20 and the verse is 28. Therefore, Take heed to yourselves and to the entire flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, who is purchased with his own blood? The church. Because according again to the book of Ephesians, the church has the Savior. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of the church because He is the head of the church. Do we have the assurance of salvation in the church? There is an assurance of salvation in the church because according to verse 25, Acts, uh, Ephesians 5, Christ also loved the church and He gave Himself for it. And that is the love of God for his church. Now, let us continue. What is the purpose? Why he redeemed 
the church. Verse 27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This echo the message of Peter, be holy for I am holy. And when you look at the context in the Old Testament, you will be amazed by the teachings of God. Now in verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Meaning, we are members of his church. Some people say, our name is the church of Christ. But their pamphlets and their magazines would say, we are not members of the first century church that Christ established. They are wrong because they are not members. We as a Seventh-day Adventist, we are members of his body. Why in the last days? Because we are called remnant of the woman and the husband of the woman is none other than Jesus Christ and he is also the head. We are members because our teaching is the same. Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. The remnant church kept the Sabbath. That's why we are members of his body. Now, this is a great mystery according to Paul. But he said in verse 32, I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Don't believe those people who say, I don't want to be a member of the church. Father, forgive them because they really don't know what they are saying. When they keep on saying that, when they say that, they were simply rejecting the headship of Jesus Christ in connection with his body, the church. Now, this is the love of Jesus Christ for his church. The same covenant, okay, in the New Testament, Sometimes he is called the head, he is the savior, he is the shepherd, he is the rock. But also, when you look at the statement of Paul, <clears throat> okay, <coughs> in Ephesians and in Colossians, you will see his mindset about the church let me check one verse here let's turn our bible to the book of Let's say Colossians. Again, let's go to the book of Colossians. Okay, chapter, chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So, if Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body, it means He is the Savior of the church. This is the love of God for us. Not only He redeemed us from the curse, from the curse of the law, from the curse of sin, but also He saved us and put us to be part of His body which is none other than the church. Amen? So, when you read again 
the statement of Paul, you will be amazed by his interest and understanding when it comes to the salvation of the church. And this is very, very easy to understand in the book of Ephesians and in the book of Colossians. Now, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this God, according to him, according to Paul, again, let us, let's take a look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And if you would ask something like, what is the form of Jesus before he came to earth? What was his form? And the answer is in the book of Philippians chapter 2. So let's take a look at the form of Jesus Christ before he came to earth. Chapter 2, verse 5, beginning from verse 5. Let this mind be in you all which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So, what was his form? The form of God. But according to 1 Timothy chapter 3.16, this God was revealed in the flesh. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there is an assurance of salvation in the church because Jesus Christ purchased this church with his own blood. And Paul says that All right, our internet is, <laughs> is not doing well. So anyway, uh, yes, Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us. This is very important because the coming of Jesus Christ revealed his love toward his church. And I would like to read uh, two more verses, okay? This is very interesting passage in the New Testament because some people ignore this, but I'd like to stress, stress uh, this point of John. Open your Bible with me to the book of 1 John. Okay? Look at 1 John chapter 5. Maybe four, four verses, sorry. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 20, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. So who has come? The Son of God. And has given us understanding. So that we may know Him, okay, that is the Son of God, who is true. And we are in Him, who is true. His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God. Alright, welcome back again. Praise the Lord. So, 1 John 5.20, In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God in eternal life. Now, when you compare that eternal life to chapter 1 of 1 John, beginning from verse 2, okay, of verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have touched, concerning the word of life, the life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and announced to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was revealed to us. So, the eternal life was with the Father. Okay? But according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, 
that eternal life is Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Okay? Now, this is the key word here. He is God. Okay? But according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, this is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In our native tongue, in Filipino uh, language, uh, let me translate this verse 2. At dito ay ating nakikilala ang Espiritu ng Diyos, ang bawat Espiritu na nagsasabi na si Kristo'y naparitong nasalaman ay mula sa Diyos. Hindi po bang nakuha? Siya ay naparitong nasa laman. Hindi po naparitong laman, kundi naparitong nasa laman. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And then, also in uh, that is 1 John chapter 4 and then 2 John okay Verse 7, look at your Bible, 2 John verse 7. For many deceivers who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh have gone out into the world. Each one is a deceiver and an antichrist. Why in the flesh? Because God was revealed in the the flesh and that is why the prophecy in the Old Testament and in the New Testament the application or the let's say revelation of God's love the word became the uh, literal translation there is the word came in the flesh and dwelt among us the reason why? To redeem, to purchase his church with his own blood. He gave up his life for it. That's the manifestation of God's love for us. That's the message of the Psalm of Solomon. First, it's about marriage, husband and wife. For King Solomon, it's about his bride. But the entire message and the application is the love of God who dwelt and became flesh or dwelt in the flesh or come in the flesh because he purchased his church with his own blood. That's the manifestation of God's love. This is only an introduction to the gospel because... There's also another title for Jesus Christ and he is also called the Son. And maybe later uh, we will try to look at the Bible. What is the meaning of being Son? Okay? Because this is very important to our understanding of the Gospel. If you can, uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, understand why he is called Son, sometimes Son of God, Son of Man, you will appreciate the gospel and you will appreciate more the grace and the love of God towards you. You will have a positive thinking. You will have positive mind that you are secure in the hands of God. May the Lord bless us all this evening and may the Lord give us His grace every day because every day we are facing new threats and new problems every day in our lives. And that is why we need grace every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Our dear God, Heavenly Father, 
the God whom we cannot see. But we can see you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because he is the image of the invisible God. He is the express image of you, the brightness of your glory. Thank you, God, for letting us understand your love to each and every one of us. That from the very beginning in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, when the God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. The Savior, the Redeemer, our rock, our friend, decided to be like one of his created beings. And he showed that heavenly father when he came and be like us and live among men to save us from sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, heavenly father, for that gift of love that through him we can approach you. And someday, if those all redeemed will be in one place in the new city called Jerusalem, we will be with you and you will be with us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for that wonderful promise. I pray for our brothers and sisters, O oh Lord. You know our hearts, you know our requests, you know our sufferings. You know our unspoken request. You know the desire of our hearts. Heavenly Father, we're just happy that we have a God like you who can redeem, who can save, who can heal, who can restore, and who can redeem us from all our sins. And tonight we praise you, Lord, because we believe you hear our prayers. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are members of Christ's church, and he is our Savior. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you all, brothers and sisters in Christ. So next Wednesday, uh, we'll be having our uh, evangelism virtually, October 9 to 23, 2021. Uh, if you have a pencil or ball pen, you can write down the Zoom ID. Here is the Zoom ID, 990-6801. 0601. Again, the Zoom ID 990 6801 0601. Password no space. God is love. God is capital and the rest is small letter. God is love. No space. Okay? So again, password. God is love. Our guest speaker is none other than Pastor Abel Cordero. May God bless us all this evening.